Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To call ourselves a Christian, to be a disciple, means that we model our lives solely based on Jesus Christ. We don't model our lives by looking to anyone else as an example. We look always and only to him. And Jesus was very clear about the way he died, and the way he died is the way that we ought to live, in absolute service to others. These words should mean a great deal to us as we live in a culture that's just rolling from crisis to crisis as conflict continues to escalate. As people say, you need to learn how to stand up. Well, instead of purposing to stand up, we purposefully stoop down. We choose to serve. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have convictions, but the way that we communicate our convictions should be through compassionate service. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I want to take you all the way back to 1894 in Bavaria. A group of Austrian boys and girls were roughhousing. They were playing cowboys and Indians. And there's one particular five-year-old boy. His name is Joseph Kruberger. And he was a little bit big for his age. And so he was watching out for the smaller kids. And he noticed a little four-year-old boy... He had his eye on him particularly because he was small, he was frail, he was sickly, he was wearing thick glasses. And sure enough, this little boy, as they played their game, he fell over an embankment and into the icy water of the Inn River. And so Joseph Kruberger, not even thinking for a moment, but again, just five years old, he jumped into the icy water and saved this little four-year-old boy. Local newspapers said that Joseph Kruberger was a hero and he was destined for great things, and he was. Kruberger would grow up to be a priest, and he would spend his life serving others. But that little four-year-old boy that he saved, that little boy would grow up to become Adolf Hitler. And up to the day he died, Kruberger had a recurring nightmare. He, in fact, he had sleepless nights wondering if in that split second, if he had not saved that little boy, how the world would have been a different place. Maybe six million Jews would not have been killed. Perhaps hundreds and thousands of people globally, their lives would have not been sent into upheaval from the Second World War. But I would contend that the problem was not with Kruberger because Kruberger did exactly as he should have done. He served in the moment, and there's no way for him to have known what the consequences would have been. The problem was with that young man, Adolf Hitler, because his life was delivered and he used that delivered life to bring destruction to so many others. We can see what a tragedy that is. But while it might not be on the same scale, wouldn't it be the same thing, really, if, if a life that's delivered, not, not that you would destroy other people, but if you lived a life indifferent to other people, would that really be much better? Now I want to take you back, not to Bavaria in 1894, I want to take you all the way back to Capernaum, you know, 27 A.D. or so. Capernaum sits on the Sea of Galilee, and for Jesus' early ministry, this was his headquarters. This is, this is where the corporate offices were for Jesus' early ministry. And here in Capernaum, in Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 2, we have Jesus' first miracles. We have him as he comes on to the global stage to become the Messiah, to be the Messiah that was predicted so long ago in the Older Testament. And these first two miracles are rather interesting because Jesus is in the synagogue and he heals a man of demonic possession. And next he's going to go to Peter's house, one of his early disciples, and he's going to deliver Peter's mother-in-law from a physical illness. And I just like to hold those two miracles in, in a little bit of tension and a little bit of contrast. Here's a man, here's a woman. Here's a spiritual issue, here's a physical issue. Here's in the synagogue, here's in the house. B basically, Jesus can heal anyone of anything, anytime, anywhere. Jesus is the healing Messiah. So after Jesus delivers this man from his demonic possession, he does go to Simon Peter's house where he will heal his mother-in-law. And here's what it says in Mark chapter 1, verse 29. 
As soon as he left the synagogue, he went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, and he told her, they told him about her at once, so he went to her, he took her by the hand, he raised her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Now, I want to point out some specific words here because these words, they do communicate the action that happened here in Peter's house, but they go a little bit deeper as well. So Jesus goes into Simon Peter's house, and it says that Jesus, once he was aware that the mother-in-law was sick, he went to her. Now, those words, and I'm going to use a big phrase, those are incarnational words. Those are the words of Jesus approaching us. So, so get this. Simon Peter, after he saw Jesus deliver this man from a demonic element in his life, he knew Jesus had power to heal. And you know Simon knew that his mother-in-law was sick and at home and in bed. I mean, right now you know who in your family is who do, who's doing well and who's not. So you know in Peter's mind, he was probably strategizing, how do I get Jesus into my house, and maybe he'll see my mother-in-law, and maybe he will heal her. Was it okay for Peter to kind of play it that way? Well, it depends on who Jesus is. If Jesus is a reluctant Savior, no. If Jesus is inconvenienced by our ills, then no. But Jesus is not that way at all. As soon as he found out there was a need, he went to her, much as Jesus in eternity seeing the sinfulness of our lives and the way that we've ravaged our world by sin, he is not a reluctant Savior. He went to us. He comes to us. Earth should have been quarantined from heaven. But Jesus comes to us. I I read an interesting statistic lately that 50% of people who are sick, they'll, they'll do several things. When they're sick, they either won't go to the doctor. When they do go to the doctor and they're given a prescription, they don't get it filled. And if they do get it filled, they don't take the entirety of the prescription. So half of people who are sick, they don't do what they need to do to get better, either going to the doctor or filling the prescription or taking the whole prescription until it's gone. But interesting, those same people, when their dog is sick, 100% of the time, They will go to the vet, they will get the prescription, they'll make sure their dog takes it all. Why do people take better care of their dogs than they do themselves? The only speculation that's been made is this, that deep down some people don't believe they deserve to feel good, and deep down many people believe that they don't deserve to be rescued. And maybe you feel that way today. Maybe you feel undeserving for God to reach out to you and God to rescue your life. Here's the deal, that's not your decision to make. It's not your decision to decide whether you are worth saving or not. Jesus has already decided that you are. And in fact, that's why he went from heaven to earth. He comes from heaven to earth. And that's why he, we see this modeled as he went to Simon Peter's mother-in-law. So, so we have very salvation language here, or in, excuse me, incarnational language. And the words that follow are salvation words. So he went to her. He took her by the hand, and he helped her up. Again, as Jesus went to her, that's incarnational. As Jesus reaches for her and lifts her up, those are salvation words. He lifted her up by the hand. Here's the thing about Jesus' healing. Jesus never did anything always. Uh, He never did the same thing twice, and I, I like that phrase. He never did anything always. Sometimes he would heal by lifting up somebody by the hand. Sometimes he would heal by touching their wounds directly. Sometimes he would heal at a distance just by giving his words. Sometimes Jesus would heal immediately, as we see here in Mark 1, and sometimes Jesus would heal as a part of the process. It would take some time. One time he healed a man who was blind, and he healed him gradually and restored his sight step by step. Sometimes the healing Jesus brings is going to be in the moment. But sometimes Jesus takes his time in healing us so that we will learn how to trust him more. I have a good friend in the church who recently, after her mother died, she and her sister decided to do something unusual. They took their mother's cookbook 
and decided to, to go through all the recipes and cook every recipe in their mother's cookbook. And as they made all of these recipes, as they cooked and as they baked, they would take these dishes and they would give them away and they would tell others, this is our mother's recipe. And I, I thought that to be a, a brilliant way of using grief to serve other people. But do you see what's happening here? It's a process of coming out of grief and being restored. So we see Jesus here. And this is a miraculous healing in the moment. But there's so much more at stake here. We see here incarnational language and salvation language that Jesus went to her. He lifted her up. Now, where most of the time when I've heard this preached or taught, okay, Jesus has come to us. He's rescued us, and now we should serve because immediately Simon Peter's mother-in-law gets up and she give, begins to serve everyone. So it's, you know, God has come to us, we've been saved, we should serve. I think that's missing an important step. Certainly Jesus Christ has come to us, that's the incarnation. And he has rescued us, he has restored us, that is salvation. But between salvation and service, there's another element there, and it's this, gratitude. I don't want us to overlook the reason that Simon Peter's mother-in-law got up immediately and started serving Jesus and his disciples. Let's not miss the motivation behind that. It is deep gratitude. Thank you for rescuing my life. Thank you for delivering me. And now I'm going to use this life that you delivered. I'm not going to use it to destroy others, and I'm not going to use it and just be indifferent to others. I'm going to serve others. And that deep gratitude, that gratitude piece is important. Because as you and I are called to serve God any day, in any given situation, most of our service to Him will fall into two camps. When you, when you set out to serve God with your life, you're going to discover two things come up all the time. There'll be many opportunities to serve that you feel are beneath you, and there will be many opportunities to serve that you will feel like are beyond you. Just think about that for a minute. We, we would like life to be that, okay, God's delivered me. I'm going to serve him now, and everything is going to be in that Goldilocks zone. This is what I can do. This is what I enjoy doing. We would like it to be that way. But most of the time, when Jesus calls us to serve, he's going to call us to do some things that we feel are beneath us. Why would we do that? Gratitude. Gratitude is the motivation behind some of these things. So for 28 years, Gene has worked in a plastic tubing factory and her only job for 28 years, eight hours a day, was to punch holes into this plastic tubing. That was her entire job. It's not a job that most people aspire to. It's not a job most people dream about. But what she knew is this plastic tubing was used for chemotherapy patients. And when she punched the holes into the tubing, if she didn't do her job right, then the medication would not get to the people that needed it most. There, there would be a problem. Or that little plastic punch could break off and harm the patient. So every time she punched a hole in that plastic tubing, she would take that little hole that she had punched, that little piece of plastic, and put it in a jar. And over 28 years, that jar became a second jar, third jar, fourth jar. She would keep them in front of her all the time because every punched piece of plastic represented one life that she had helped. Now, Jean will never be acknowledged as a hero. And she could have easily, years ago, become disillusioned and say, this is beneath me, but she operates out of gratitude. What you'll also find when, at times, God invites you to do something, it won't be something that you feel is beneath you, it's going to be something you feel is beyond you. I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't have the training or the giftedness to do this. I, I don't know if I've ever told this before. I don't think so. 21 years ago, I came to meet with the search team of this church, of First Baptist Tulsa. And I'd been an associate pastor and had served a small country church. And I'd never been in an environment like this before, uh, serving in a leadership role, a lead pastor role. So I spent the whole weekend with the committee, and we had a great time, and, and I kind of felt like this may be where God wanted us to be. Then they said, hey, it's been a busy weekend. Let's take you back to your hotel. You can take a nap and, and rest a little bit. So they took me back to the double tree, crashed out for a while. When I woke up, I woke up scared. I just wanted to go home. I wanted to get on a plane and go back to Montgomery, Alabama that very day. I just wanted to, I wanted my mommy is what I wanted, right? 
I was just scared. I was overwhelmed. I'll tell you another secret. There's not a whole lot of times over the last 21 years uh, that that feeling has ever left me. It's just so much that's beyond me. But what, how do we continue to serve when things are even beyond us? Gratitude. You've delivered this life. Now instead of using it to destroy and instead of using it just to be indifferent, we will use it to serve. Just remember that as, as you face life and some things you feel are, are beneath you and some things are beyond you, realize that Jesus Christ is within you. And we keep on serving anyway. Now, usually when this passage is taught, this is where it ends, right? But I want to keep on going. Because there's something that happens next that I believe that Peter's mother-in-law was highly involved in. So she began to serve them. And this is in verse 32 of Mark 1. When evening came... After the sun had set, they brought to Jesus all those who were sick and demon-possessed. And the whole town assembled at the door. And Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases, drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. So it's the end of the Sabbath. Now, Jesus had broken the Sabbath tradition twice here. And this is what caused some scandal. Work was forbidden on the Sabbath. But here he had delivered man from demonic activity. He had delivered a woman from her physical sickness. But when the sun went down, that's when it's kind of like the dinner bell being rung. People had heard that Jesus had healed. Now it's the end of the Sabbath. Now it was okay for Jesus to heal. Well, it was already okay for him to heal. But here they come. They come to the door. They come to be delivered. They come to be rescued. They come to be healed. And who do you think was right there in the middle of all of it? Simon Peter's mother-in-law. I don't think she served just Jesus and the disciples. I think she was right in the middle of this. So, so now I want to ask you to use your imagination here for just a minute. And imagine um, this fall you go to a football game, okay? And it's been a long time since we experienced something like this. But let's say you go to a football game. The football game's over and everyone's going out of the stadium. So it's right after Texas beats OU, some, something like that. Just use your imagination. That may be a prophecy. We'll see. So all the people are pouring out of the station. And so you're the stadium. So you're, you're in this corridor and it's packed. Your people are right next to you all around. Now, we've just come through COVID, so that's probably going to freak you out a little bit the first time that happens. But now imagine everyone around you is coughing and sneezing and wheezing and hacking. And, and what you're going to do is you're going to go, where's my mask? It's going to freak you out. You're going to go into self-preservation mode. Well, here's a woman who had just been healed. And I could imagine some well-meaning people say, you need to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself right now. Let's rest. Let's take it easy. No, she was right there in the middle of all the coughing, all the hacking, all the sneezing because of gratitude. So we can apply that here right now to our own lives. I'm not saying that COVID is over, but we're getting really close to the end of this. And we made it. What are you going to do with it? You see, there's, there's really two ways to choose to live. Either you can wait for something to take your life, and something will take all of us at some point. Or we can choose to give our lives. Which way will you live? And, and again, I'm not jumping the gun and saying COVID's over, but when we make it to this other side, you have been rescued. You have been restored. You've been delivered from this. What will you do with it? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if we are truly modeling our lives after Jesus, if he has truly rescued us spiritually, and yet again, he's rescued us physically, what are we going to do with it? We should serve. What are we waiting for? There's an old parable of the ant and the centipede. And the ant has six legs, of course, and it moves around rather freely. And it's talking to the centipede one day, and it's like, I've got six legs, and I can barely keep up. It's, You're a centipede. You have a hundred legs. How do you know which leg to move next? H how do you think through that? And the centipede goes, well, I've never really thought about it at all. And the ant goes, well, think about it. And as the centipede begins to think about it, he becomes confused, and he doesn't know which leg to move next, and he becomes paralyzed. So we can see this big wide world around us and say there's so much to do and Jesus has called us to serve and sometimes we don't know what the next right thing is to do and we be can become paralyzed. Let me encourage you to do two things that are very simple. First of all, see people. Just 
as you live your life, see people. And, and we often categorize people even subconsciously. We have a lot of people that we idolize, and we have a lot of people that we demonize. Listen, the world does not need another celebrity, and the world doesn't need any more people to demonize others. That's, we often do that. We just idolize some people and demonize others. The way most of us live in our lives is we utilize people. We think, how can I use them to accomplish my purpose or my job or advance my career? As followers of Jesus, we don't idolize or demonize or utilize. We, we humanize people. Every person you meet has needs. And just so see people. And as you see people, be sensitive to God. People are going to cross your path today. They're going to cross your path this week. They're going to cross your path this year. And just to say, God, who do you want me to serve in your name? And maybe it'll be something that is beneath you. Maybe it'll be in a way that's, that's beyond you. But what drives that is our gratitude. Because my life in Christ has been delivered. One of the worst ways I could waste it would be to be indifferent toward the needs of others. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Pope Leo IX, one of my favorite popes of history, here's why. He banned cats. He didn't like cats very much, and so he was in the medieval world, and so he kind of took this idea that black cats were a sign of the devil. And so he, in a papal encyclical, he banned cats, and and so people all over Europe began to kill black cats. And then not only did they kill black cats, but they thought, well, that cat has a little black in its tail. I'm going to kill that cat just in case. And so there was a wholesale slaughter of cats in Europe during the Middle Ages. Well, what happened? And here's what you need to understand. Cats in that day weren't house pets. They were scavengers. And they were a very natural way to keep the mice and the rat population under control, Right? Well, with the cats dead, then the rodent population took off. Now, this is largely circumstantial, but I think it holds up that a few decades later, all the cats, many cats have been killed off. Rat population is booming. It wasn't long until the first plagues began to sweep through Europe that came from fleas who were on the back of rats. And 25 million Europeans died. Here's the point of that story. Then in God's great system, God can use even a cat. I can't believe I'm saying something like that. God can use even cats. And if he has plans for cats, I'm sure he has plans for you as well. What happened? Jesus Christ has come to us. Whether you feel like you deserve to be rescued or not, he's decided you're worth saving. And he offers to pick us up, to lift us up, to deliver us from death and eternity apart from him. And then out of that flows gratitude. And out of that gratitude flows service. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you're not serving today, if you're not actively looking for ways to serve God in your life, it could be that you lack gratitude. And if you lack gratitude, it could be that you have never experienced the deliverance of God through Jesus Christ. For without Jesus, we deserve to die. With Jesus, who has taken our death for us, we don't deserve to live, but we get to live because of his grace and his mercy on us. And what he asks from us before he will come into our life is a simple yes. And maybe you're ready to do that today. God, thank you that you have taken the initiative in Jesus Christ, that you have been incarnational toward us, that you have come in flesh. And your incarnation has produced in us salvation. And your salvation produces in us gratitude. And that gratitude overflows in service. What are we waiting for? God, would you bring some people across our path today and this week whom we can serve? Would nothing be beneath us or beyond us? And even when we feel like it is, would we still operate in gratitude? 
For even you did not come to be served, but to serve and to give your life. Help us to live in the same way. What are we waiting for? Jesus, it is in your name that we offer our prayer today. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may God grant you peace now and forever. Amen.